<laughs> okay. Yesterday, we went over how to factor basic trinomials, and those trinomials look like this first example I have right here. So this is the general form of the, the type of trinomial that we factored yesterday. And this is kind of like an example of, of what a factorization of that might look like. <clears throat> so those are kind of considered, when we're talking about factoring, those are considered sort of the basic or the more easy examples. In this chapter, we look at some that are slightly different. So the big difference is the coefficient on this x. Notice how we have an a up there. What that changes about the factorization is that it gives coefficients in front of the x's. And that's really, that's one of the big differences. Um, but what you'll find as we go through this is that one little a up there in front of the x squared, it screws everything up. <laughs> and so, like, you know, those patterns that we learned yesterday, those aren't quite valid anymore, at least with these types, right? And so, if you want to use the pattern that we used yesterday, there cannot be a coefficient up here other than one, all right? But if there is a coefficient other than one, you're going to want to use the stuff that we learned today. <clears throat> so, once again, in general, this is the type of trinomial we'll be learning to factor today. ax squared plus bx plus c. Um, so there's this little sort of diagram on how this is done on page, uh, page whatever of your book. Um, and basically, I guess I don't need to get it out. Uh, basically, this diagram goes through the foil, but it's the new type of foil. Right? So now the f term is no longer going to be just x squared. Uh oh. Sorry about that. We need like a lamp in this room to get somewhere in between so that you guys aren't falling asleep. And um, yeah. All right, so just try not to fall asleep, okay guys? <laughs> All right, so the difference is going to be we're going to have coefficients in front of our x terms when we have this this type of thing for an example okay so right here they kind of go through step-by-step -step instructions on how to use a guess and check method this is considered the brute force method uh, guess and check will work eventually but especially with these it, you know if you have the wrong type of uh, trinomial guess and check could take you an hour or more like you could have a lot of examples um, so we're going to go over guess and check but the, the factor by grouping method that I'll teach you at the end, that's the one that you're really going to want to memorize and use because you can factor whatever with that. <clears throat> okay, so we are going to use these steps in the guess and check to guess and check for this first example right here. 3x squared minus 10x minus 8. So the guess and check says, says we go ahead and we create our factors just like we did with the last types. Um, we fill in with the x's right here, but it says we need to come up with coefficients in front of these x's, right? Uh, the product of those coefficients has to equal the coefficient of the x squared, right? And so the product of these two numbers must equal 3. The only options, since 3 is prime, is 3 and 1. So I just say 3 and 1. I know that's not going to change. <clears throat> the second step, I'm sorry, I should say the third step. The third step right here says find the two last terms whose product is C. Okay, we can do that. This is C, right? C is equal to negative 8. And so, I don't know, just to pull two terms out of the air um, whose product is 8, maybe let's just say, or is negative 8. Let's just say uh, negative 1 and positive 8. <clears throat> now I foil this out and see if it, in fact, matches the original. That's how you guess and check. And you do this until you've exhausted all the possibilities. So I have my F term. That gives me 3x squared. I have my O term. That gives me 3 times 8 is 24x. I have my I term for my inner term. That gives me negative x. And then I have my L term, negative 8. So when I put my like terms together, I end up with something that I did not want. 
right? Notice how my middle term in this one is not the same as my middle term from the original. So that was not a correct factorization. I need my middle term to be a negative 10x. This one's a plus 23x, right? And so it doesn't work. <clears throat> so next, we could, we could just start guessing and checking, right? Other factors that I could put in here are negative 2 and 4, right? Negative 4 and positive 2. Um, <laughs> that's about it for the 8s. Uh, but <clears throat> all the positions matter, too. And so if I put a negative 1 next to my 3 here and a positive 8 next to my, my 1, that's going to come out differently than if I switch these around, right? And so you have to consider both options. You'd have to consider... 3x plus 8 and plain old x minus 1 as well. So let's go through all the examples. Luckily, they did it for us in the book, so I don't have to do it up here. So this is, this is all the possibilities of this particular polynomial. So you can see if you guessed and checked uh, and you really didn't have any intuition as to which one was correct, you could spend quite a bit of time just foiling this stuff out. Right, you can see there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. There might even be a ninth one down here. I think there's eight, eight different options. Right, and so you can see right now why the method we're going to learn at the end of this is the best method because you don't need to go through these eight options. So as you can see from this particular readout, this guy is the correct one: three x plus two and x minus four. That's because it produced a negative 10 in the middle. So let's just make sure that's the case real quick. And, and we'll redo the fraction. We'll redo the uh, factorization now that we know what the answer is here. So, <clears throat> whoops. So I have 3x minus 10 minus 8. Whoops, 10x. This is equal to, and I build my factors out. And if I, if I was able to see what this should be. After enough repetition, you do end up starting to, to get the, the pattern of these, but it takes quite a while. Um, <clears throat> so I, I'd set up my x's because I know to make this first x squared term, oops, that should be a squared, I need x and x, and then just like I did the last one, I'd have to fill it in with 3 and 1, and then eventually, eventually I would guess, well, maybe I should attach a plus 2 to the 3 and a minus 4 to the 1. Right? When I finally foiled this guy out, it would give me 3x squared minus 12x plus 2x and then minus 8, which when we put it all together you could see that it matches the original. And that's exactly what we wanted. And so really it's kind of like the, the tough term to make is this middle term. Right, like you, you know, all your guess and checks, the first term and the last term should be correct. The thing that you really need to pay attention to is this middle term. This is what's going to change a lot. And since this middle term matched the middle term in our original, we are good. Okay, any questions about guessing and checking so far? Okay. Okay. <laughs> so. Suppose we are going to try and guess and check this guy. <clears throat> well, it's a little bit ugly. So let's go ahead and try. <laughs> so once again, I'm just going to write out what my factors are going to look like as far as I can tell. I have an x squared here, which means I need an x here and an x here. <clears throat> I have a 12 in front. And this, this is the type of problem where this kind of thing gets really difficult, right? Now I have a 12 in front. So my, my first number is no longer prime. That means that um, I have lots of choices here, right? I could fill this in as a 12 and a 1. Or I could fill it in as a 3 and a 4. Or a 6 and a 2, right? There's a ton of different things that I could fill this in with. And it could take forever to factor something like this. Not forever. I'm being dramatic. It could take, it could take a half an hour. <laughs> All right. So, so now that we have our first coefficients guessed, we're going to go ahead and try and fill that in. What do you guys think? What do you want to use? We have a positive 6 over there. In the end, we need to make 17 in the middle. I don't know. 
Let's just try a 2 and a 3 for now. See what happens. Plus 2, plus 3. Right? I use pluses because this middle term is a positive, so they both have to be positive. So, okay, let's foil this guy out and see what we get. 3x times 4x gives us 12x squared, just like we wanted. 3x times 3 gives us plus 9x. 2x, or sorry, 2 times 4x gives us plus 8x. <laughs> plus 6, that wasn't supposed to work out on the first time. <laughs> um, I might have just done that subconsciously because I've done this problem before. <laughs> It's not supposed to work out that way. <clears throat> so we ended up guessing the right one at first. <laughs> and so we ended up with 12x squared. All right, you can see we end up with plus 17 in the middle, x plus 6. Um, but, you know, there's so many different uh, factorizations that this could be. I mean, if you just start, think about start thinking about listing the first ones just from the initial coefficient you could have you could have like three different factorizations yeah so the the moral of the story is even though we didn't <laughs> I didn't get to show you the moral necessarily um, is learn the grouping method okay <clears throat> now we will learn the grouping method I think oh we'll do this one more time <laughs> uh, so remember when you're factoring, um, you want to put everything in descending order, okay? And one thing that we don't like when we factor is to have a negative coefficient on our leading term. So when I put this in descending order, I put the highest degree term out front. Then I start with the next lowest degree term, so plus 10x. And then I have plus 8 right here. <clears throat> so whenever, even, even if we don't have a common factor to take out of each term on here, we hate negatives on our leading term. That messes everything up. So if you ever get a negative on your leading term, just factor it out right off the bat. So I'm going to factor out a negative, which changes the sign of everything inside these parentheses. So now I have a minus 10x. Now I have a minus 8. <clears throat> okay. And since we're all here, I'm going to give you guys a chance to guess and check on your own. <laughs> so, so take about five minutes to start guessing and checking this thing, right? And here's the first steps to guess and check. Remember, you, you draw out your factors as you know that they have to look, right? We know we have an x squared here, so we know that we have two x's. The things that we don't know about yet are what we want in front of these x's and what we want as our constant terms, right? So the things in blue... Those must be a multiple, or those have to be factors of this initial term. The things in yellow, those have to multiply to give us this last term. All right, so go ahead and just start guessing and checking. See if you can find the right, and if you find the right answer, don't yell it out. Don't yell out the answer, but maybe let us know. <laughs> Thanks, Brian. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> I don't really know this, so I'm going to do some guessing and checking of my own.
Can anybody name one that doesn't work yet? Or you guys run into one that doesn't work yet? That's fine. We like jokes. Oh. Well, that makes me nervous then. <laughs> Please say it. Okay, what is it? <laughs> it's. Oh, darn it. Is this one in the book? Oh, this is the first one we did, isn't it? <laughs> that was a worthwhile joke. I, that was a worthwhile joke. <laughs> nice. <laughs> there is. The only difference is the negative sign, right? That's it. All right. <clears throat> okay. So, you know, you guys might have tried this. Three and a one here. And then you might have tried, there's a negative eight there. So maybe we'll try a negative one here and a positive eight here. Probably what we did on the first one. So then we foil that out. We'll say three X squared. Three times positive eight gives us plus 24. Minus one, whoops, 24 X minus one X. One times eight gives us negative eight. Yeah, this is not what we were looking for. 3x squared plus 23x minus 8. All right, our middle term did not match. So this is definitely not a good factor. <clears throat> but since we already realized we've done this one before, it looks like you guys are still working on this. Have you guys gone through a few examples? It's frustrating, right? Would you want to do this eight times per problem just to factor a single polynomial? No. Forget about that. We're going to learn a better way. So for this one, in the end, it is 3x plus 2 and 1x minus 4. If you want a quick way to do the guess and check, you can just consider the O and the I steps, right? And so, O, I, right? My outer multiplication is 3x times negative 4, which gives me negative 12x. Then my I multiplication, my inner, gives me plus 2x. That equals negative 10, and that's what we wanted, right? So we say, oh, those are valid. We can use those. All right, and so in the end, this, this guy is my factorization right here. And don't forget the negative sign out front. That negative that we factored out in the beginning has to stay there. Okay, <clears throat> so now that we've gone through guess and check, and we recognize that it's pretty painful, um, let's go over the grouping method. So this is really similar to the method that we, we learned uh, in the first place when you have four terms to start out with. This is just a way to sort of set up a three-term trinomial to use the grouping method. All right, and so we'll just go through these steps, and we'll we'll use the same we'll use, we'll use the same polynomial that we've been using all chapter. I really need to go through and change this thing. <clears throat> all right, so for this particular polynomial, this is the general form: ax squared plus bx plus c. All right, so. What we do here is we create a table on the side. 
on this side, we multiply a times c, right? And so for this one, it would be three times negative eight. That gives us negative 24. Okay, on the other side, we again do the sums thing, sums. And what we want is negative 10, right? The middle term again. Okay, so <clears throat> what we are looking for is two numbers that multiply to negative 24, but when we add them together, we just get a negative 10. So let's see now. How about 6 and 4? Negative 6, positive 4. 4 minus 6 is equal to negative 2, and that's not what we were looking for. So that's a big no. How about negative 1 and 24. I think it's pretty obvious that's not going to work. 24 minus 1 is 23, and that's not what we were looking for. But we could use 2 and 12, right? The difference of those two is 10, so we're going to do that. All right, so since we want a negative 10 in the end, we're going to put the negative sign on the 12. Otherwise, we get a positive 10 if we put it on the 2, right? And so negative 12 plus 2 equals negative 10, and that's what we wanted. All right, so this is, this is kind of the key step. This is the one that, that people forget the most frequently, and they stall out, and they get writer's block. So you take these two factors you just found. Oops. You take these two factors you just found, and you go back to your polynomial. The first term drops straight down. 3x squared. And here's the key. The second term splits up into these two factors. So this negative 10, this turns into a plus 2x and a minus 12x. And then the last term, the negative 8, drops straight down. Oops. All right, so now that we've created these four terms, and just notice, these two terms here, if we decided to add them back together, they would still equal this middle term, okay? And so we haven't changed the value of anything. We've just rewritten it. So now that we have our new uh, four-term polynomial, we factor it by grouping. So I put my little imaginary brackets around the first two terms. What can I factor out of these? What's the biggest thing I can factor out? Not much, huh? I can factor an x out. That's about it. 3 and 2 don't have any common factors. So I write my x out front. And then I fill it in with whatever's left. So I did not factor out the 3, so that remains. I only factored out one of these x's, so I have one x left. And then with my second term, I factored the x out, but not the 2. <clears throat> now I make my other set of little imaginary brackets, and I, I pay special attention to this negative sign. I know that's going to make a big difference. So I put my little brackets around here, and I say, yeah, I definitely need to factor out a negative, because I don't want negative signs in there, because this other factor has two positive signs. All right? so what can I factor out of here? A negative... Four, right? Yeah, and if you're not sure what you can factor out of this other one, it, it always helps. You can cheat a little bit and take a look at this first term, right? And say, well, if I want these things to match, what would I factor out? 12 divided by 4 is 3, so that's probably what I should factor out. So I'm going to factor out a negative 4, write it out front, and in parentheses, I have what's left. 3x, where the 12x used to be, and a positive 2 where the 8 used to be. Now I know I'm doing really good because my two factors match. And that has to happen before I factor by grouping. So now I write that out front, 3x plus 2. And then in the other parentheses, I put whatever was left, this whole x minus 4 thing. x minus 4. <clears throat> so there we go. There are a few steps to that, um, but in the end, if you get 
you know, if you get a little bit of practice at this, it's so much quicker than the guess and check. It's crazy. All right, so we will want to study that guy. And let's try it one more time, or a few more times. <clears throat> okay, so uh, with this next example, I just want to notice real quick, uh, remember before we do, before when we're asked to factor, the first thing we should always do is see if we can take out a common term, right? These do have common terms. All my coefficients are even, so I can definitely take out a two. And I have an x in each and, each and every term, so I could take out an x as well. And I think that's the most I can take out. So I'll just, maybe I'll show my work on this one. So um, remember the way that you show your work when you're factoring like this, you write whatever you're going to factor out first. I've decided I'm going to factor out a 2x, right? And that's multiplied by whatever's left out of this first term, so 4x squared plus 2x, factor that out, and then I have 11x remaining. And finally I have my 2x on this last term, and I have a 3 remaining. <clears throat> so remember, that's how you show your work when you factor out a common term. And after this chapter, you know, you won't have to show that anymore. I'll just assume that you know it. <clears throat> so, okay, now that I've recognized what I'm going to factor out, I'm going to go ahead and do that. I write it out front, and then I fill it in with whatever was left. 4x squared plus 11x minus 3. Okay, and then we set to work on factoring the inner polynomial. So once again, now that I know how to do factor by grouping, there's no need to use a brute force method on this. I'm going to create my table over on the side. Okay, my a times c. Remember, my a is my first term, 4 in this case, and my c is my last term, my constant term, negative 3. So a times c in this case equals negative 12. I put my sums over here, and I want positive 11, right? And so since this, this is a negative 12 over here, we'll, we're going to be talking about differences. I think it's pretty obvious on this one. Usually I try and play dumb, but I mean, the only one that's going to create a positive 11 is 12 and 1, right? So we have a negative 1 times a positive 12. 12 minus 1, that equals 11. So yeah, those are the two factors we want to use. These guys right here. So okay, here comes the crucial step. So this 2x out front, this 2x out front that we factored out, we don't touch this anymore. It's done. We just, we don't forget about it. We keep writing it out front, but it doesn't matter with the rest of the problem. So the 2x drops straight down. The 4x squared drops straight down. And this is the key the positive 11 splits up into our two factors. So I have negative 1x, and then I have plus 12x. And then the minus 3 drops straight down. If you're wondering if it matters which order those factors come in, whether I could have written plus 12 first, yeah, it, do it doesn't matter. You can write them either way, and it'll still work out. OK, so now that I have these four terms written out, I'm going to go ahead and put my little imaginary brackets around my first two terms. I'm going to write my 2x out front so I don't forget about it. Okay, so what can I factor out of these first two terms? I have a 4x and I have a 1x. What do I factor out? Yeah, just a 1x, right? There's, there's no big coefficients here. But we have an x in each term, so we're going to factor that out. So I write my x out front, and what is left is 4x minus just plain 1. All right, out of these second two terms, it looks like I have a 12 and a negative 3. I want to turn that 12 into a 4. I'm going to factor out a 3. So I have plus 3, and then I write what's left. 4x minus 1. 
Don't forget that minus one. <clears throat> now I just recognize that these two factors match, so I'm allowed to continue factoring by grouping. And I go ahead and do that. So once again, the 2x from the original just drops straight down. And then in parentheses, I have my 4x minus 1. And then in the other set of parentheses, I have whatever was left, which was x plus 3 in this case. Okay, so don't forget, try and factor out a common factor before you start everything, and then continue after that. Here's another one of those weird ones, right? Remember when we have like a variable squared over here? Those ones are a little strange looking, um, but that doesn't change the way that we handle them. So with these ones, I mean, we don't even really have to consider what the factorization is going to look like. Um, in the end, though, it, it will look like this. Um, actually, that's just going to confuse things. I'm not going to write that out. Okay, so let's go about factoring by grouping. So the first thing we do when we factor by grouping is we multiply A by C. So 6 times 15 is, I don't know, it's 90. So I have 90 over here. A times C equals 90. And then I put my sums on this side. And I want that middle term, I want plus 19. All right. So when we're talking about factors of 90, we could start with 1 and 90, but that's, that's, oh, and actually, let, let's notice real quick, since all these are positive terms, right, A and C was positive, so all I have is a positive here, and I want a positive number as a sum, all we need to do is think about two factors of 90 that add to give us 19, right? A lot of times we're looking at the difference. This time, we're looking at adding them to give us 19. So... Hmm, five times, <laughs> five times 18. The suspense is killing you. <laughs> five times 18, right? 18 plus five, that's not what we're looking for. That's 23. That's no. Um, hmm, three and 30? No, that equals 33. What do you guys think? What's a, what should I try? Excellent. I like that idea. Let's try it out. 9 times 10. Yeah, that equals 90. 9 plus 10. Yeah, that equals 19. So boom, that's the exact two factors we want to use. We go ahead and circle them, and then we go back to our polynomial. <coughs> All right, so remember this step. This is the one that, that people forget most frequently. The first term drops straight down, 6r squared. The second term, 19rw, splits into our two factors that we found. So the first one, we're just going to say plus 9rw. The second one, we're going to say plus 10rw. And then the 15w squared just drops straight down. Be careful. Don't make the mistake of, <laughs> of splitting up that R and W. That's definitely not supposed to happen here, right? Don't write 9R and 10W because everything's going to go wrong. <laughs> Keep those variables the same. All right, <clears throat> so now we factor it by grouping. I go ahead and put my little imaginary uh, parentheses around the first two, and I can factor out at least an R. Also, I think a 3. I'm going to try that out. So I have 3r out front, 2r plus 3w left. So I do the same thing with the last two terms. And it looks like, let's see now, I can definitely take a w out. Looks like I could take a 5w out. So that leaves me with 2r plus 3w. And that's good, because that matches my other factor. 
So now I do the last step of factor by grouping, which is write the common factor out front, and then in a second set of parentheses, write whatever's left. So that's that. That's a pretty solid method. Um, yeah. It takes a little bit of repetition to get used to, um, without a doubt. Like, I think, I think I was foolish when I was studying algebra and I didn't learn it and I just used brute force and it, it, it I wasted like a few hours on that at least. Um, so yeah, now that I've learned it, I, I don't think I learned it until I started teaching this class. And then I was like, oh, why didn't I use that when I was in algebra and beyond? That's what I get. Okay. That's a blank page, so we're moving on. <clears throat> Okay, so the next section, 5.4. Uh, this one is all about factoring. Uh, it's, it's sort of the, the special product section when it comes to factoring, right? We're going to go back over all our special products, but we're going to go over them in reverse now. All right, so the first one that we go over is recognizing perfect square trinomials. So... To recognize a perfect square trinomial, all you have to do is make sure that your polynomial conforms to one of these two patterns. Okay, so for this first one, x squared plus 6x plus 9, if I want to, if I want to determine if this is a perfect square trinomial, first I identify a, okay, a equals x in this one, then I identify b, b equals 3 in this one. Be careful, right, because the b, the capital B, should be the square root of this last term, right, not the last term itself, right? So my b is equal to 3 and not 9. So then I, I just, I write out, I write out what a perfect square trinomial would look like if this were a and b, and I see if it matches the one that I currently have. All right? And so a perfect square trinomial should look like this. a squared plus 2ab plus b squared. Okay, if my a is x, then I have x squared plus 2 times a times b, so I have 2 times x times 3. And then on the last term, I have b squared. I have plus 3 squared. When I do the math on this, I get x squared plus 6x plus 9. And, and that is the original polynomial. So yeah, that is a perfect square trinomial. So we can use this formula for factoring. Personally, I don't know. I feel like the, the perfect square trinomial formulas are a little bit more tedious than they're worth time-wise, but it'll be up to you guys whether you use them. Um, so this one, now that I know it's a perfect square trinomial, I can just say, well, this must equal a plus b quantity squared. And so now I just plug in a and b. So this has to equal x plus 3 quantity squared. So you confirm that it's a perfect square trinomial and then you can use the formula. So for this next one, <clears throat> t squared minus 8t minus 9. Hmm. What do you guys think? Can you tell right off the bat if this is a perfect square trinomial? Especially given this last term. Check out the formulas. There's no negative sign there, which means we're not allowed to have a negative sign in our form. So if we have a minus constant term back here, it's automatically not a perfect square trinomial. Okay, so you can just skip all that and say, nope. Okay. 
All right, with the next one. This next one, we've got to rearrange it before we start, okay? And that's because my constant term is placed in the middle. We don't want that. The constant term should be placed on the end. So I have 16x squared minus 56x plus 49. So if this can form to the perfect square trinomial, it would look like this. a squared plus oops, wouldn't be a plus, it would be a negative, minus 2ab plus b squared. All right, and so I say my a in this case would be the square root of this first term. That's 4x. My b is the square root of the last term, and so that's 7. So now I make sure that this actually does conform to that pattern. <clears throat> um, so I'm going to go ahead and just, maybe I'll fill it in directly below my little formula that I have up here. So my a squared, that is 4x quantity squared, minus 2ab, that is minus 2 times a, which is 4x, times b, which is 7, plus b squared, which is 7 squared. When I do the math on that, I end up with 16x squared, um, what is that? That is a 56, isn't it? Minus 56x plus 49. So yeah, this does fit the form of a perfect square trinomial. And I noticed my instructions just said, determine whether each was a perfect square trinomial. So I don't necessarily need to factor these. But I can say right here, yes, this is a perfect square trinomial. Okay, <clears throat> next, they ask us to use the formula. Um, so in the last example, we already determined that this was a perfect square trinomial, and I jumped the gun and I wrote out the factorization. Um, but since we do know it fits this form, we can still just use this formula again. So a plus b squared. My a is equal to the square root of the first term, so that's just equal to x. My b is equal to the square root of the last term, so that's just equal to 3. So this guy must factor into x plus 3 quantity squared. <clears throat> this one here. Uh, so for this one here, my a, that would have to be the square root of my first term. I, the square root of this is 10x. My b, that is the square root of the last term, the constant term. So that's just 9. All right, so I need to find out if this particular uh, polynomial conforms, right? <clears throat> and really, when I write out the whole polynomial, that's, that's maybe a little bit of, that's kind of a waste of our time maybe. We already know that the first term and the last term equal uh, a squared and b squared, what we really need to compare is this middle term here, right? We need to make sure that 2ab or negative 2ab does in fact equal negative 180. So negative 2ab, right, that's equal to negative 2 times a, which was 10x, times b, which was 9. When we do the math on this, we do actually come out with negative 180x. So yeah, that works for a perfect square trinomial. So we just use our formula. Our formula says when this is what we're dealing with, a squared minus 2ab plus b squared, this results in a, whoops, not a plus b, but a minus b. A minus b quantity squared. All right, so for this one, my a is 10x, my b is 9, and I just square that all the day. Okay. <clears throat> Let's keep going with these. And I'm actually 
Not sure if I'll have time, so I might have to skip a couple of those. Okay. <clears throat> so, oops, sorry. <laughs> Let's keep going. So here's another one, right? So uh, my A is the square root of this first term. So A is 2P. My B is the square root of the last term. So my B is equal to 3T. Uh, negative negative 2AB, that is equal to negative 2 times A, which is 2P, times B, which is 3T. In the end, 2 times 2 times 3, that does end up giving us negative 12PT. But yeah, that's a perfect square trinomial, and we can just use the same formula that we used on this last one up here. So this is just equal to a minus b quantity squared. So I just have 2p minus 3t quantity squared. <clears throat> and with this final example, um, we just want to make sure that we once again factor out a common term uh, and, and also I have a negative on my leading term, which means I want to get rid of that too, because that's not going to do me any favors. Um, hmm. I think I can also factor out a 3. So I'm going to try to factor out negative 3m. So let's do a little bit of practice of this mental math. If I was to take negative 3m out of this first term, what would I have left? And mentally, you should be thinking about dividing those two things, right? And say, okay, if I want to do this in my head, this is the problem I want to think about. Negative 75m cubed over negative 3m. Right? This is the problem that we do in our heads. Okay, so the negatives would cancel. 75 divided by 3, that gives us 25. m cubed divided by m, that gives us m squared. Right, so that's the little problem that you're doing in your head when you move straight into this, this factoring. So that's what I had left was 25m squared. What about this second term? If we divide negative 60m squared by negative 3m, what do we get out? You guys are so not talkative today. <laughs> All right, so what do we get out, right? It's, it's a positive, we know that, because a, a negative divided by another negative, that's a positive. And so let's, let's take this apart just like we would if we had this, this fraction up here. 60 divided by three, what's that equal? 20, good. All right, m squared over m, what's that equal? Yeah, just m, right? You cancel the m on the bottom, you cancel one on the top, and you just have m remaining, right? That's, that's a little bit of mental math that you're going to want to get used to a little bit, you know? Uh, and, and you don't need to be an expert at it now. You just want to practice it a little bit. All right, so what about the negative 12m? If we divide negative 12m by negative 3m, what do we get? And this is how we do this, right? We say, well, what's the sign? It's a double negative, so it's got to be a positive sign. And then we say, well, what's 12 divided by 3? 4. What's m divided by m? 1. So there's nothing that comes out of that. And so now we're done. <clears throat> okay. Now, let's see if this inner polynomial conforms to our perfect square trinomial, and then we can use our little formula. Okay, so a would be the square root of the first term, so a would equal 5m. b would be the square root of the last term, so b would have to equal 2. Um, we have a positive in the middle, so we use our plus 2ab form, so 2ab, that is equal to 2 times 5m times 2. Yeah, there we go, 20m. 
So yeah, this is a perfect square trinomial. So we're going to use our formula. So I have a minus 3m, and the formula says it's a plus b quantity squared. So if my a is 5m and my b is 2, I can just square that and call it a day. You know, that definitely would save some time. <laughs> if you recognize that, that would save some time over the grouping method with something ugly like this. Yeah, so it might be worthwhile to familiarize yourselves with this. <clears throat> All right, let's move on. So now we have difference of squares, right? This is one that I like to use all the time. I would say you should memorize this because it's really easy to memorize and it appears almost everywhere. <clears throat> so the only thing that you need to do to uh, ensure that this is a difference of squares is that you just have to make sure that this has an even square root and this has an even square root. That's about it, right? And you have to make sure there's a, a negative sign in the middle. Okay, so we say, well, the square root of 9x squared, that is equal to 3x. So yeah, there's an even square root to that. The square root of 64, that is equal to 8. So yeah, there's, there's an even square root to that too. So this is, in fact, a difference of squares. Right, so this follows the form a squared minus b squared. And this says that if you get this, the factorization is going to be a plus b, a minus b. So that's how I fill this in. Right, and I recognize that my a is equal to the square root of the first term, so I have 3x. 8 is equal to b. So I have 3x plus 8, 3x minus 8. <clears throat> and we were only supposed to determine if those were difference of squares, so I jumped the gun again. What do you guys think? Is this difference of squares? Right, there's an even square root to the first term, 5. But if we take the square root of t cubed, we don't really do that at this point. So in this class, there's definitely not an even square root to this. So we're just going to say no. <laughs> in yellow highlighter, we'll say no. <laughs> All right. Uh, when you run into something like this, you can just flip them around so that the negative comes second, right? So that it actually looks like the formula. So this one can be rewritten as 36 minus 4x to the 10th. All right. Uh, and so I can say that my a is equal to the square root of 36 if it exists, which it does. And my b, that's equal to the square root of 4x to the 10th, which is just... 2x to the fifth. Okay, so yeah, I do have a couple of even square roots for that. So I know that this just has to equal a plus b minus, or times a minus b. All right, if my a is 6, I have 6 plus 2x to the fifth times 6 minus 2x to the fifth. jumped ahead on that factoring once again. Okay, <clears throat> so this next example, we know it's a difference of squares, right? It's pretty obvious. So what does this factor into? A plus B, A minus B. We can do this one in our heads just right away. This is X plus two, X minus two. And that's really when this is going to come in handy, is when you can just sort of recognize it and write it out like that. Okay, for this next one, my a is just equal to 1. My b is just equal to the square root of that second term, which is just 3p. So this is equal to 1 plus 3p times 1 minus 3p, and that's it. 
right? Difference of squares, super easy. Once you learn to recognize them, they're super easy to use. <clears throat> okay. Um, I'll do this next one. So even though these are different variables, it doesn't really matter, right? We just say a is equal to the square root of this first term, which is going to be s cubed. b is equal to the square root of the second term, which is 4t to the fifth. Okay, so this is a squared plus b, or sorry, a plus b, which is s cubed plus 4t to the fifth. And then we have a minus b, s cubed minus 4t to the fifth. All right, so for this next one, oh, actually, this next one's a terrible example. <laughs> no, this is a good one. Uh, I won't let you guys do it, though. <laughs> it's, a, it's a trick question. So in this next one, um, the first thing you want to do, right, just because we're using special products doesn't mean we can't still factor out a common term, right? These don't have even square roots, but we could factor out we could factor out a two. Yeah, we can actually factor out a two x squared. So we're gonna do that. So this is equal to two x squared. When I divide 50 x squared by two x squared, right, 50 divided by two, that's 25. X squared divided by x squared, that's just one. So I, I have what I have. With his second term, the negative eight x squared, put my negative out there. If I divided 8x to the 8th by 2x squared, I would have 8 over 2, which gives me 4. And then I have x to the 8th over x squared, right? And if we use the subtraction rule, we know that we just take away 2 from the 8. So I have 4x to the 6th. Okay, now that I put it in this format, why don't you guys try and use difference of squares on this inner polynomial here? All right, so select your A, select your B. Remember the A is the square root of this first term. The B is the square root of this second term. And then use your formula. So you might have noticed <clears throat> your a is equal to the square root of 25, so that's just a, uh, 5. Your b, that's equal to the square root of 4x to the 6th, so that's just 2x cubed. So now we just fill this guy out. The 2x squared stays out there. And then on the inside, I have a plus b, so I have 5 plus 2x cubed. 
then I have a minus b, 5 minus 2x cubed. And there we go. Okay, so this last example, <clears throat> this definitely does not conform because there's no subtraction sign in here. Um, and as a matter of fact, any time that you see something like this, an x squared plus a constant term, it cannot be factored. Don't waste your time. All right? If you see x squared minus a constant term, then there's, there's a chance you can factor it. But if it's x squared plus a constant term, there's just no way. And I'll show you why. So this is actually x squared plus 0x plus 16. All right? This, if it did factor, would factor into something like this, with x's as my two coefficients. Right? And then I would say, I am now looking for, these must be either both positive or both negative, these two factors, right? And I would say, they're both positive and both negative, and they have to add to zero. That's not really possible, right? Like, you know, the only way that you can get a zero in the middle is if you have one positive and one negative. If you have both positive and both negative, you can't make a zero out of that sum. So that's why you'll never ever be able to factor something that's just an x squared plus a constant term. So if you see that, you can immediately just say prime. <clears throat> okay, so here's an example on factoring completely. This is, this is a really great example. This is definitely something that I, I love to put on tests is when you have to factor a couple of times down. Right? And so with this one, we notice that this is a difference of squares, right? And so I could say a is equal to y squared, b is equal to 4. So if I use my difference of squares formula on this, this is y squared plus 4, then y squared minus 4. So the key on this problem is to recognize that you have another difference of squares hiding in here and to factor it one last time. Right, and so now my new a, my new a is equal to y, and my new b, that's equal to 2. So the first factor stays the same, y squared plus 4, because that's prime. And then the second factor is what we split up here. So now that gives me y plus 2, y minus 2. And that's how you break that up. And so just so you guys know um, why we're doing all this stuff, right? what's the point of all this factorization stuff? Why do we have to factorize polynomials? Um, the, the key to that is we're solving them. right? And so if, if I ask you to solve uh, an equation that looked like this, y squared minus 16 equals 0, you would do that by first factoring it and then doing something with those factors, which we're going to learn later on. So, you know, just so you know, this stuff isn't disconnected. We're, you know, factoring equations is the first step to solving equations. And so solving ugly things like this is going gonna, is gonna to rely purely on our ability to factor ugly things like that. Okay. We have tips for factoring on page 332, in case uh, you like to look at those when you go through your homework. Um, and maybe we'll go over just one more grouping example, just because grouping's weird. <laughs> and it's, it's tough. I know it's really tough to get the hang of grouping when you first start. There's a few extra steps to it. And so we'll just do one extra example here before I let you guys go. I know it's been a long class. Thank you for keeping up. Okay. So for this one, once again, we just recognize that this has a coefficient in front of the x squared, so it is an ugly example. So now we make our table. On one side of our table, we have a times c. Okay, 8 times negative 12. What is that? 8 times negative 12. That gives us a negative 96. All right, the middle term, that's a 29. So we say sums over here on the other side. And we want 29, a positive 29. Right? Since we're talking about a negative 96, we are going to be thinking about a difference of two factors instead of a sum. All right? So for something large like this, we can really just sort of start out at the beginning. Right? 96 is even. 
I'm going to say 96 divided by 2. Well, that's 48. So the difference between 48 and 2 is clearly not 29, right? Uh, so let's see now. So we had 48 and 2. If we added, oops, and negative 2, we'll say. Uh, 48 minus 2, that gives us 46. Right? Now we could try and divide 96 by 3. 96 divided by 3. So now, and that's the right one, um, but I, I was going to sort of outline my strategy on this, right? And so if you start off, right, if the sum you want is a very large number, the things that you're going to be looking for right off the bat are the ones that are very far apart, right? And so since I analyzed 96 divided by 2 and it was a larger number than I wanted, I know that I can kick it down a notch, right? But, but if what I wanted was a really low number, like a 1 or a 2, I'd be looking for two factors that were right next to each other, right? And so I wouldn't bother with 48 times 2 or even 3 times 32. I'd start with something really close, right? But since the number we want is very large, I'm likely to find my solution in the larger factors, which I did like right off the bat. So uh, 96 divided by 3, that's 32. And so if we have a positive 32 and a negative 3, we end up getting what we want. 32 minus 3 equals 29. That is what we were looking for. So these are the two factors we're going to split our middle term into. All right, your first term drops straight down, 8x squared. Your second term, remember this is the key, it splits up into these two factors you found, plus 32x minus 3x. And then your constant term comes straight down too. All right, now we factor by grouping. So I highlight these first two terms and I say, what can I pull out of these things? Um, I think 32 might be divisible by 8. It is. Okay, so I can pull an 8x out of these first two terms. So I'm going to do that. So I have 8x. And on the inside, let's see now, what do I have left? 8x squared divided by 8x. That leaves me with a single x. 32x squared divided by 8x. That leaves me with a plus 4. All right, then when I highlight my second two terms, I notice right off the bat they're both negative. I don't want that, so I, I'm going to need to factor out a negative. And I can factor out a negative 3 as a common term. So that leaves me with x plus 4. And now my two terms match just like I wanted them to. And I can move on to, to complete the factor by grouping. So I have x plus 4 in front. And then in the second set of parentheses, I have whatever was left, 8x minus 3. And that's it. OK. I have one more example, but we've been through enough today, right? Um, thank you for your patience. This is a tough, this is a tough uh, few chapters to make it through. Um, but if you got some extra time this weekend, don't slack on your factoring practice. You want to be good at factoring, right? And so take it, even if it's just a half an hour uh, on Sunday and Saturday. Oh wait, it's spring break, isn't it? So. I want you to study for 10 hours. No, just kidding. Uh, you know, even if it's just like 15 minutes a day, even less than that, 10 minutes a day, just doing factoring, and you'll be good at this. I promise. <laughs> yeah, and we have a quiz the Wednesday afterwards, right? On the quiz, the stuff that we're going to be going over is factoring a plain polynomial, and we will be going over at least one example of this grouping method. So you'll want to you'll want to know how to do them both. Okay, and well, not necessarily the grouping method, but something an uglier method. So you'll either want to remember the grouping method or be willing to do guess and check, which is no fun. All right.